we've worked on particularly storage and germination, um, especially of cacti uh, seeds, but more than that uh, in terms of the Millennium Seed Bank project and partnership. Um, and today I'm going to talk you know, on topics related to that around sustainable landscapes and the native seed agronomy deficit. That sounds rather grand, and I'm going to unpick it as I go through the next 45 minutes. Uh, I, I couldn't really um, come back to, to UNAM um, without introducing Q. So I need to give you a few slides on, on the Institute and on my research group. I'll then talk about, in a sense, unsustainable landscapes. That is the main problem that we have to live with at the moment. Um, what we can do about those landscapes in terms of accessing seeds to restore, how that fits into these wider ambitions of the bond challenge to restore millions of hectares of land and the role that seeds can play uh, in that and, and then emphasize the importance of characterizing seeds so that you choose seed lots which are, which are well adapted uh, for use in that particular environment. So this is the integration uh, of the talk. So Q Science, I don't know if, if you know that there are six main science departments, uh, collections, identification and naming, conservation science, natural capital and plant health, biodiversity information and spatial analysis, and in red, comparative plant and fungal biology, and my group sits within that uh, group. Uh, across the whole of Q, probably 250 or so scientists, nearly 100 honorary research associates, and we support about 50 PhD students a year, because Q is not a university, so we are co-supervisors on university studentships, and we've done that uh, for many, many decades. Uh, the priorities for Q are, are threefold, and they're mostly enshrined in um, the Natural Heritage Act uh, of 1983, when Q came under a board of trustees, and they are to carry out research to um, curate, well, to, to improve, actually, uh, the uh, number of collections and to curate them um, carefully and to share that information as best as we can, and then to disseminate, um, including through public outreach. So those are the, the broad scientific priorities for Q, and these are clearly articulated in the Global uh, Resource for Plants and Fungal Knowledge, which is a science strategy through to 2020. So from 2021, we have a new science strategy. And in last year, uh, the, the science collection strategy was launched through to 2028. Patricia's already mentioned the Q cryosphere. That's in the collection strategy. And I'll be dis discussing that tomorrow at uh, Itzacala. Uh, the buildings, I don't know how many of you have visited Kew in West London, but there are two main science facilities there, the herbarium, um, established in the 19th century, now with, what, nearly 8 million pressed plant specimens, so the largest herbarium in the world, and the George Laboratory, also established in the 19th century, through a private donation by uh, T.J. Phillips Jodrell to investigate plant structure, and in fact also to investigate plant health, and we see, you know, in science often the full turning of the cycle or the circle uh, because plant health is increasingly an issue um, in, in Britain in terms of climate change and pest and diseases moving from southern Europe northwards. So uh, we've come full circle in many ways uh, in the Jodrell, but they do molecular systematics and, and so on there. And then the third building is, is not at Kew in London, but at Wakehurst Place, which is south of London, and this is um, Wakehurst Place. <clears throat> uh, on the left-hand side, you have the mansion from 1590. And on the right-hand side, the Wellcome Trust Millennium Building, which is the home of the Millennium Seed Bank. The Millennium Seed Bank is the vault, the actual vault. Um, and we moved from the mansion. So I did my early science in my career in a mansion from 1590. Not suited to modern science, one has to say, uh, to this open plan, concrete, steel, and glass building, which we describe as inside out. So the central area here, you see that the dome with the glass front is a public space. So the public are on the inside of the building and they can look out at the scientists in the wings uh, doing their science. So from small corridors to this open space. Um, the main seed bank uh, so far has about 41,000 species banked as duplicates. 
So any seed that comes to the UK comes under what's known as CBD compliant agreements around the fair and equitable sharing of any benefits that accrue. In any case, um, any movement of germplasm in this way is, has a non-commercialization clause in it as well. It's a conservation project, um, not an exploitation project. So this is the building. Um, for those of you who want a sabbatical or to do your PhD studentship with us, there are 14 study bedrooms on site. And the topics that we really pursue here are threefold. The diagnostics area around molecular biology and biochemistry, so we're well set up for GC mass spec and HPLC. Um, around ecophysiology, and I'll talk a little bit about that today, um, we have a broad range of environmental chambers um, and a dark room. And then structural biology, <clears throat> we're particularly interested in understanding how seed material um, is preserved at low humidity and low temperature. And that's to do with the physical form of the seeds. That's that. And we use differential scanning calorimetry and dynamic mechanical analysis to look at that. So those are our specialisms around function, whereas a Q primarily the interest is around systematics and taxonomy. So that's the slight difference between the two sites. Uh, and then uh, for the department that I'm in, comparative plant and fungal biology, we have a broad uh, sort of scientific vision around understanding the principles to determine plant and fungal diversity. And there are four teams, um, comparative seed biology obviously being one, comparative fungal biology, then integrated monography, um, and also character evolution. And our scientific priorities relate to building the tree of life, uh, path toll, plant and fungal tree of life, a molecular backbone for all the genera of the plants and fungal kingdom, and then trait-based research and lineage-focused research, and the red text signifies that my group mainly works in those two areas, trait-based research and lineage-focused research. This is the core group, um, of which uh, there are four uh, postdoctoral fellows, plus myself. Um, and we have up to about 15 visiting scientists a year, uh, either postdocs or people on sabbatical or PhD students or master's students as well. So Charlotte Seal uh, is a biochemist with an interest in salt stress uh, and in modeling of germination responses. And Cesar Ordonez is here and knows Charlotte very well. Um, Anna Vischer, who's a molecular biologist, um, again with an interest in salt, um, but, but particularly in extremophily. So one of the projects for the future we'd like to do is to put seeds on the outside of the space station. Uh, Louise Coville is a biochemist, particularly specializing in reac reactive oxygen species. So the oxidative components of viability loss uh, in seeds. And Danny Ballesteros uh, is a structural biologist and cryobiologist which is a little bit like my, my background. I, I put some metrics up because we've just been through a science audit this year, so I, I, I know these are accurate, uh, from 2012 through to, to now. Uh, we've been involved in uh, projects worth about seven million pounds, a couple of large EU projects. <clears throat> uh, we published 143 peer-reviewed journal papers across the group as a whole. And more importantly, I think, uh, we are very much outward looking and uh, in any 10 year period we can pretty much guarantee that we will be co-authoring with scientists from about 30 nations. So we, we're very much wanting to connect uh, across the world. I include one paper bottom right hand corner which I'll come back to later. One of our bigger papers I would say in global change biology with Patricia's group uh, and a number of other um, institutes uh, across Latin America looking at the germination performance of more than 50 species of cacti. As I say, I'll come back to that later. So that's Q Science and uh, the research group. Um, and I want to move on to the main theme of the seminar. So um, I say sustainable landscapes, question mark, and I really mean unsustainable landscapes. This is Millennium Ecosystem Assessment uh, data, which is a compilation of data over about 100 years, and it's giving trends. And the, the red boxes signifies the greatest um, impact and, and negative uh, impact on biodiversity. Uh, the arrows, uh, if they're facing upwards, it just means that things are getting worse. So if, if it's a red box, it's bad. 
and if the arrow is up, it's even getting worse than bad. Uh, and you can see that for, for tropical forest, um, on the left side, it's a, it's a red box with an upward arrow, and also temperate grassland uh, are two um, uh, habitats which are particularly under threat uh, from habitat change, generally from conversion to, to agriculture. But, but all of these landscapes uh, are at threat from climate change, from invasive species, from over-exploitation, uh, and from pollution. So landscapes are in a, a pretty bad state uh, globally. And the question is, what well, can we do anything about it? Uh, one way of looking at how bad they are is this soil degradation map from the United Nations Environment Program. Um, and in essence, there's only Canada and Russia, based on this analysis, that's not really going through uh, soil degradation. Uh, you see Mexico is painted uh, in red. Um, but that's true of many regions uh, of the world. So one uh, outcome of the degradation of, uh, or the, um, the breaking up, the fragmentation of landscapes uh, is ultimately soil degradation uh, as well. Now, people are aware of this, of course, and even the policymakers, and there are a couple of policy initiatives which I'll just draw on now to, to explain that there is a sort of fight back Firstly is the HE biodiversity targets that go through to 2020. Strategic goal B on reducing the direct pressures on biodiversity and promote sustainable use. Target five, natural habitat uh, degradation and fragmentation is significantly reduced. That's one main target. And then also under HE, under strategic goal D, enhance the benefits to all from biodiversity and ecosystem services. Target 15 talks about restoration of at least 15% of degraded ecosystems. So there's a call to arms to do something about these degraded uh, environments. That's the first policy initiative. The second one is the bond challenge, which some of you may have heard of, uh, started in 2011, signed up by tens of, of countries. And the objective is to uh, bring 150 million hectares of deforested and degraded land into restoration by 2020. They may just about do that. And 350 million hectares by 2030. So these are huge areas. And Mexico is committed to bring into restoration 8.47 million hectares, mainly uh, the two forest types of broadleaf um, uh, and coniferous forests, with the potential benefits highlighted around water quality and biodiversity. But the thing about restoring 350 million hectares <coughs> is that generally, uh, but the issue about uh, restoration of <coughs> environments is that if you're sowing at four kilograms of seed per hectare, which is about average, then <coughs> that would be equivalent to 1.4 million tons of seed. Let me go through that again. Four kilograms of seed a hectare is 1.4 million tons of seed. If you wild harvest 1.4 million tons of seed, you will wipe out species. So this is not an approach to restoring and making landscapes sustainable. We cannot wild harvest that material. <clears throat> so where do we get the seeds from? Um, well, there are a couple of uh, access routes in terms of in situ and ex situ persistence. Now, obviously, you've got seeds in the soil seed bank, and you have seeds in ex situ seed banks. Um, and we've been involved in a project that's looked at native um, seed production for restoration. So I'm just going to draw on a little bit of information from Holly Abandonado, from Emma Ladusor, and from Ted Chapman, two PhD students. And Ted is <coughs> head of the UK Native Seed Hub. So <coughs> in terms of soil seed banks, uh, persistence and mast, you can see from this range of species that there's quite a high... Uh, seed density per square meter, depending on the species, actually depending on seed mass as well. So the larger seeds tend to have a, a lower number of seeds per square meter. So Vena fatua, about 79. And down at the bottom of the page, Vabascum thapsus, which is a very small seed, uh, 449 seeds per square meter. So it's easy to see that you could, <coughs> through turning over soil potentially, restore that environment. However, it's not necessarily the case that the seeds in the soil seed bank are exactly the species that you want to restore the, um, the, the mix of species in that particular landscape. 
They will not necessarily coincide, one being more historical than what you may want at this moment in time. And of course, you will have lost a number of species through attrition, through predation, and so on, in the intervening period. And so some of those critical species um, for that habitat may already be lost. So we can't rely on in situ soil seed bank natural regeneration for that habitat. <coughs> However, those seeds might hang around for a long period of time. So there's some good examples here of seeds with, which uh, are still viable <coughs> after more than 100 years. The species which are shaded in grey are those which tend to have germinated off of barium vouchers. There are many examples, in fact. Uh, the two red species are from the soil seed bank. I've mentioned Vabascum on the previous slide. Vabascum blatera at the bottom, moth mullen, <coughs> was the only species out of 20 that were buried in Dr. Beale's experiment from 1875 in milk bottles placed in soil underground and then exhumed every few years. Um, and so this very small seed, which you might think would run out of energy, somehow is able to survive buried in the soil for 120 years. Extraordinary. Uh, the other species in red, Nalumbo, sacred lotus, exhumed from a dry riverbed in northeast China, um, certainly had carbon-dated seeds from 202 to around 1,300 years, all germinating. The oldest had some genetic problem, um, but uh, the midpoint was 466 years. So that renewal from the soil seed bank could happen over many, many decades and potentially uh, centuries. The best known example is actually a single seed of Phoenix dactylifera exhumed in Mount Masada in the Middle East after 2,000 years, carbon dated as such, and germinating very uh, healthily. This is Elaine Sori and uh, uh, Sarah Salon uh, back in 2005. But that type of longevity is exceptional. That's not the norm. And this data, 417 species of seeds from the soil seed bank of temperate uh, floras in northwest Europe shows that mainly the species produce seeds that will survive in the soil seed bank for about 25 years or less. So that really is a marker for survival rather than these exceptional lifespans of hundreds of years or a thousand years. So that's in the soil seed bank. We've also got aerial seed banks. And there's two different types of aerial seed banks, which I think are fascinating. Uh, the first one is found in cold environments, so temperate uh, environments, uh, such as uh, northern Europe, Canada, uh, Russia, and so on. Uh, and Fraxinus excelsior, ash, is a very good example, where the seeds hang on the, the tree over winter. The ash keys hang there through winter. And that's a very interesting survival mechanism, because obviously it's extremely cold. And then the other example, which we're more familiar with, it's extremely hot. Um, and those are the, the aerial seed banks, for example, in uh, Mediterranean environments, which are fire prone. So the bank, banks here, uh, shown here, in, in fact, might have seeds that last uh, on the tree for uh, many, many years, probably more than a decade. And in this instance, the seed is released in the presence of fire, which opens up uh, uh, the banks here, uh, capsule, and the seed is dropped onto bare ground and germinates immediately. So there are a limited number of examples of aerial seed banks as well, um, which might contribute to uh, the recovery of landscapes. If we are to think about drawing seeds from uh, ex situ seed banks, such as the one at Itzikala or the Millennium Seed Bank, or here, as you see on the left-hand side, the Germplasm Bank of Wild Species uh, in China, in south, southwest China, Yunnan province, then uh, the challenge is that probably we only have 30,000, 40, or 50,000 seeds per accession. And if you're talking about large-scale landscape restoration, this is not enough seeds. And the reason for that is these are conservation collections. They're not restoration collections. They're two different things completely. For the MSB, uh, I mentioned before about the broad targets, so that by uh, now, in the last phase, we've conserved another 15,000 species that's 41,000 in total. So as I say, these are conservation collections. And um, Merritt and Dix in 2011 very uh, clearly laid out the problems with ex situ seed banks when it comes to restoration. They defined a new type of seed bank, restoration seed bank, uh, where consideration was given to the volume of seed that would be needed uh, for restoration. And also talked about the importance of it being science-led, 
and to consider also seed farming. And by that I mean native seed agronomy, seed farming. Uh, Merritt and Dixon also pointed out there are huge challenges. One is that you may have an attrition level of maybe 90% of the seeds that are sown um, are not, do not become established. And one of the challenges there in terms of an efficient uh, functioning of a restoration seed bank is having enough information on how to germinate the material, how to, how, how to overcome dormancy in wild species. It's not a problem with, with crop species where dormancy has been bred out, but in wild species this uh, remains a problem. So a lack of seed pretreatment for on-demand dormancy release. How do we ensure uh, efficient germination from these seed lots in restoration seed banks? So um, moving on to the fourth section, our, our response to Q to this bond challenge uh, on restoring 350 million hectares by 2030 has been twofold. First, the UK Native Seed Hub. This is a, a seed farming exercise, we might say. And secondly, on the right-hand side, we've been involved in a four-year EU project uh, called Native Seed Science, Technology and Conservation, an, 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 sorry, an innovation or an initial training network for PhD students, about which I'll say some more. And we did an awful lot of work on seed germination and dormancy uh, and considered seed sources as well. In other words, connecting uh, the characteristics of the seed lot to, to, the, to the origin of the seeds. So for NASTEC, um, there were three work programs, firstly around in, to in situ seed sampling, looking at biogeography of the species, uh, how do you choose the species for use on, on the basis of traits, and seed uh, phenomics, including seeding phenomics. Uh, secondly, under work program B, seed biology characterization, um, alpine seed dormancy was reviewed, grassland uh, species propagation, uh, seed longevity, and the infraspecific variation that we see between seed lots as well. And then subprogram C, seed production and deployment. So, so very much towards the agronomy aspect, the nursery uh, side uh, of wild uh, native species um, production, including concerns around certification, quality assurance uh, as well. And you see here that uh, there were seven main partners in the, in the project. There are four research institutes, Q, the James Hutton Institute in Scotland, the University of Pavia in Italy, and Museo Trento, the museum in Trento, um, and our interests academically were more towards uh, subprogram A and B in green and blue. Uh, and then you see the seed companies were far more interested in subprogram C on, on seed production. And the companies were Scotia Seeds in Scotland, Syngenta in the Netherlands, and Simia Silvestra in Spain. So this is how it looked in terms of the 11 ESRs, early stage researchers, or in this instance, PhD students. You see that Q uh, led on, on, on two, uh, Christina and Antonio. Christina at the moment is at the Seed Ecology meeting in, in Germany with Louise Coville, one of the Q supervisory team. But we also supported another five uh, PhD students across um, the consortium. I'm gonna say a little bit about uh, some of the data from, from those projects now. Now, the first one is to do with uh, Emma Ladousseur's work. Um, and what she focused on was uh, what was the availability of seed um, for grasslands of conservation concern based on Natura 2000. So grasslands of Europe are mapped out. The ones which are at greatest risk are well known. Um, and she wanted to know how many species are there in those particular areas and how easy would it be to access material? Bearing in mind uh, what uh, Dixon, Merritt and Dixon said about restoration seed banks. So her first data set is here. What she found is that there are 1,123 species uh, within those areas of conservation concern um, uh, in, the, in these grasslands. And, and what uh, Emma did was to look at the availability of those seeds from the main seed supplier for native seed in each of 17 countries in Europe. Uh, and so she could immediately get a feel for easy availability. Uh, and this is shown in orange on this graph. And you see for the different species, uh, fodder, of which there were 77 species, and then in the middle, uh, indicator species, of which there are 929 species, uh, and protected species, of which there are 117 species, that the availability 
varies hugely. So for fodder species, because they're part of the certification system of, ag of agriculture in Europe, they are easily available in the trade. So 70%, the orange bar on the right side, 70% of those species uh, are commercially available, very easy. For indicator species, only 45% or so. If it's a protected species, less than 2%. So if you're talking about getting highly uh, threatened species back into the environment, you're not likely to be able to purchase commercial seed. Then what Emma also looked at was the availability of germination data. And she relied in this instance on the left side, the seed information database, um, which is a, a Q database openly accessible to you um, from your institutes, uh, where you can type in a species name and get uh, germination performance, hopefully. And supported also by the Baskin and Baskin's book on seeds, edition two was released in 2014. I think there's <clears throat> more than 10,000 species in there. And then what we find, <coughs> excuse me, is when you combine with in the lime green color, the availability of seed commercially and information on germination as one data set, then again for the fodder species, probably 60% roughly, you have both. You can source the material and you can germinate it. But then for the indicator species, only 30%. And for the protected species, hardly any. So this just highlights the importance, even with a well-described flora, European flora, um, for um, areas which are well known, so defined in Natura 2000, that there's a great deal more of seed biology needed to characterize seed lots and make that information available. And that will be absolutely more the case uh, in the tropics where seed biology is very less characterized. Um, the other findings that, that Holly Abandonado uh, came to, or, or conclusion that she came to, was that in discussing what uh, a whole range of end users wanted from native seed provision, including land managers, so there were 54 land managers consulted on this out of about 200 in total, is the main thing is origin. They want to know that they're putting seeds back into the environment from which they came. That's the key thing. And then beyond that, uh, viability and germination dormancy are the key criteria of, of uh, selection in order that end users are satisfied with the material that's being provided to them for their restoration projects. Now, um, the, even in Europe, the uh, native seed production uh, industry is pretty nascent, it's pretty embryonic, and far less advanced than Australia and the US. And one of the benefits of NASTEC was that we were able to bring together a group of European producers to establish a new European Native Seed Producers Association, and that's now slotted into the Society of Eco Ecological Restorations international uh, uh, network for seed-based restoration. So at least the producers are speaking to each other, they are uh, collectively developing one voice, because ultimately what they're going to have to do in Europe is lobby the EU around regulation that makes the provision of native seed a bit more easy, uh, because it's heavily biased in terms of the law towards fodder species. If you're interested in some of the findings of NASTEC, then uh, I co-edited a special volume of plant biology that was um, published in May this year, there's an editorial plus 21 papers. And what's interesting in there is that there's a comparison between the native seed production systems as currently operating in Germany, where they are focusing an, a great deal on certification, in the United States, where they have a national strategy for availability of, of native seeds, and in Brazil, where there's a very strong community involvement in restoration using uh, native seeds. So the second uh, responsive cue to the Bond Challenge is the UK Native Seed Hub. The aim was to increase the quality and diversity of native plant materials um, in order to improve habitat restoration. And they have done an extraordinary job in supporting 57 projects in the last uh, seven or so years and regenerated 44 species. And the middle photograph you see here are the seed plots or the plant plots at Wakehurst Place close to the, the main building. So we're producing uh, seed uh, on site 
and guaranteeing quality and purity uh, and so on. Now, our passion for this is that, um, sadly, the availability of commercial seed is such that it's very tempting to just buy whatever you can. Uh, and I just want to draw your attention to the bottom of the slide here with the red dots, which is a comparison of costs. So this is for one hectare of grassland. Um, and the cost of allowing natural regeneration is 640 uh, pounds. Uh, and that's set as a, as a unit value of one. Okay. Now, if you were to purchase commercial seed and sow uh, that, then just to this side here, um, the ratio is about four times higher if you're using commercial seed, but it's about half the cost of using native seed, which is 7.8 times higher than natural regeneration. So there's your challenge, that, that uh, commercial seed just um, undermines uh, the native seed uh, production industry in many ways. Uh, the costs here are based on brush or hand harvesting of seed. So you were either talking about in a sort of natural landscape, going through and, and harvesting large quantities, uh, sort of mechanically, perhaps, uh, or uh, hand harvesting in, in these uh, plant beds uh, at Wakehurst. But it's about eight times more expensive than if it's natural regeneration. So the temptation is to go for commercial seeds. And then the problem with commercial seeds is, as you see on the right-hand side, there's a limited range. You're not going to be restoring the natural habitat or even half the natural habitat. The quality of the seed is surprisingly variable also. Um, the producers want to sell seed uh, quickly. Uh, so there's variable quality for sure, and uh, there's less local origin material. They don't mind necessarily where the seed comes from. They just want to sell it. Um, and that means that we're not sure that that seed availability or seed that's available is functionally fit for purpose. What do I mean by functionally fit for purpose. Well, we've been studying, this is, this is the last part of the talk, uh, seed functional traits, and particularly the effects of temperature and water on the germination of seeds, and how that varies. Those control, uh, control points vary um, between different wild species, uh, and considerably. And we've looked at a whole range of, of species, crop wild relatives, CWR, mountain species, cacti with UNAM uh, and others. And just to acknowledge the work here of Charlotte Seal, Eduardo Fernandez Pascal, Rosangela Pico, and Elena Castilla Lorenzo. So um, this very interesting paper by uh, Diaz in 2016 spoke about being able to describe uh, a global spectrum of plant form and function. And you could do that by five vegetative traits and one uh, reproductive trait. So the vegetative traits are nitrogen content, leaf area, the height of the plant, stem-specific area, so density, uh, and leaf, leaf mass per area uh, as well, and seed mass. And, and seed mass is a physical uh, attribute. Uh, and um, there's an awful lot more to seeds than seed mass. It is the, the trait that's available from the TRY database, T-R-Y, uh, and it's the easiest one to measure because you're just weighing seeds. Um, but there's all of these traits beyond seed mass. Dispersal syndrome, coat thickness, oil content, longevity in the soil I mentioned earlier, and temperature or water stress for germination rate. In other words, a physiological trait, which I want to talk about a little bit more now because they describe the seed lot. The best way to look at this is look at a, uh, the probability of occurrence, in this instance a germination uh, event, against temperature. And there's basically a sort of normal distribution. If we look at the orange line, that's the current temperature. This is a projection by the Climate Commission of Australia. And the red line is what might happen in the future. So if we look at the germination performance of species A, we find it has a pretty broad range of temperatures over which germination occurs. Yeah? And you can see that it, the seed will perform well under the orange line conditions. And even under the red line conditions, the majority of seeds in the population will probably germinate. If we then consider species B with a narrow range of temperatures, then it will perform well now under the orange conditions and very badly under the red conditions. This just emphasizes the importance of characterizing seed lots 
for these limits, these thresholds, the onset and the end. And in fact, there's an optimum in the middle as well. Yeah? And we can do that um, not just for temperature, but also for water stress. And we can do that simply by adding to the germination test mannitol or polyethylene glycol, just applying more and more um, water stress to remove water or hydration from the germination response. And you will reach a point below which, when it's so relatively dry, a sort of drought condition, germination will not happen. And we can define those minimum temperatures, T base, and minimum water potential, Psi base, very clearly for seed lots, very clearly. And we do that by using our set of environmental chambers. Um, and we can set up all sorts of, of temperature controls. Now, let me just deal firstly, though, with this optimum condition, because what we're really passionate about here in understanding performance is also how to relate the microenvironment in the incubator to the IPCC projections for climate in the future. In other words, what does a two degree centigrade rise in temperature mean for germination performance? This is really quite an important question. So uh, with the Global Change Biology Study on cacti, what we have here is out of the 55 tacks that we worked on, around 30 species, we had very, very detailed data. And then we could co-plot uh, germination performance against these projections for um, IPCC. So just to point out here, that red dot here is plus 3.7 degrees centigrade above current temperature. And the dash bar is the optimum temperature for germination. So this species here, even with an increase in temperature, the optimum temperature for the species is above that which will happen in the future. So those species will be, that species will be fine. But this species here will not, because now the temperature is above the optimum. And in fact, about one quarter of the species on this list would be at threat from a reduced germination performance as a result of plus 3.7 degrees centigrade increase. So we can match our microenvironment modeling in incubators to performance through IPCC, including we've done this through soil burial, uh, seed burial experiments uh, through, through the winter as well. So that's the optimum. What about the other characteristics, the minimum temperature and the minimum water potential for germination? And comparing seed traits with vegetative traits. So following the Diaz paper, uh, we chose uh, six pairs of congenetic species in Campanulaceae and one pair of co-family species at the same altitude, so they were in, in the Italian Alps, so that there was the same mean annual temperature, the same amount of snow cover, and the only difference was the soil. So you can imagine that, that uh, plants at high altitude have particular adaptations to leaves. So you've got high UV light, then you have smaller leaves and they're thicker. Okay? And that's what Diaz really explored in that, that uh, uh, six trait analysis. Now we're saying, well, maybe the vegetative traits don't give you a good performance uh, of niche or, or, or a good selection of niche preference of species um, at pretty much the same conditions. So that's what we're looking at here. And uh, what we find then is if we look at the data from the TRI database for specific leaf area, for leaf area, for dry leaf matter, so we only had three of the five that Diaz used. Uh, then from the PCA on the left side, the species from calcareous soils and from siliceous soils cannot be separated based on vegetative traits. It doesn't help you. Because all of the plants are adapted to that environment in terms of the vegetative material. But if we look at the specifics of the seed germination traits, then we can separate these species out. We find that the calcareous species have a higher base temperature, so they germinate at a higher temperature onset, and they have a lower base water potential. In other words, they germinate better under low water conditions. And that would make sense because the calcareous soils would allow permeability of water, so it's probably a bit more stressful in terms of water availability, and these species seeds are adapted to respond uh, to those conditions. So the vegetative traits do not give you the separation in the way that germination traits do. 
And the final example is with some crop wild relatives of brassica. Uh, in this instance, uh, we have above the wild species of brassicas from across Europe and North uh, Africa, and below we have the crop lines and the inbred line, research lines. And just to point out the base temperature, so this is germination rate here against temperature. Um, it decreases systematically to identify the minimum. And it's around uh, 4 degrees centigrade for these two crop wild relatives. And for the commercial sea lot, maybe a little lower at, say, 2 degrees centigrade. But the big difference is here. This now is water potential. This is in water. This is more and more stressful coming this way. And you see here now for the commercial sea lots, there's a high base water potential, maybe now at minus 0.7 megapascals. And for the crop wild relatives, much lower at below minus 1 megapascal. So these seeds are adapted to dryland uh, conditions. The point is this, that in this review, in biological reviews, at the end of last year, <clears throat> what we are defining is that whilst ecologists have spent many, many decades simply recording seed mass, we need also to be recording seed physiological traits. And what's important is that the physiological traits, um, in a sense, um, provide a thermal memory or a water stress memory uh, that is sensed in the parent plant as the seed is developing uh, and is um, expressed later in the germination performance downstream. And so it's not sufficient for us to understand seed lots uh, or performance on the basis of seed mass. It needs to be on the basis of seed, uh, seed physiology. So the summary is uh, landscapes are badly degraded. I think we all uh, accept that. That there's a global restoration target which will demand a huge quantity uh, of seed, that the existing sources of native seeds in the trade are insufficient, particularly for in indicator or protected species. Um, and anyway, those accessions may not necessarily, if they're commercial seed lots, be properly adapted to that environment. So we need to understand uh, the functional characterization. And uh, my conclusion really is that the native seed agronomy deficit will only be addressed when national agricultural research systems, NAS, such as Embrapa in Brazil, uh, move towards uh, applying their understanding of agronomy of crops to the agronomy of native species. And in so doing, they will attract business, industry, towards working with those species, which at the moment are beyond their general remit. So we need a public-private partnership in order to address the availability of native seeds for restoration. I'm sorry for the coughing and splushing in the middle, uh, but I think I can take questions at the end as well, because my voice, thank you for the lozenge, that was great. What do you think about the invigorate seed germination of all um, freshies with priming? Priming? Yes. Yes. Um, well, again, the number of species that's been looked at is not that broad, and the driver for priming is to improve the homogeneity of germination uh, seedling emergence. So the agricultural sector has been very interested in that. Um, there is a downside, which is the vast majority of seeds that have been primed. When the companies then want to dry back and store the seed, they have shorter lifespan. So the storability is less. Mm -hmm. Now, the companies may not worry so much about that because they probably are selling their seed within two seasons or something. Um, so there's a positive and there's a negative to, to priming, but the idea of trying to ensure that you have a more homogeneous emergence of your whole um, accession of seeds is, is, is a strong one. But with wild species, maybe a little bit undermined by the presence of dormancy in some of the population. Yeah? to calculate the balance, uh, costs, benefits. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, as yes. with all of these issues, which is why I showed the, the figures for the grassland restoration uh, and um, using native seeds, you know, it's four times more expensive, uh, sorry, eight times more expensive, and for the commercial seeds, it's only four times more expensive. It is always a question of cost, cost benefit, yeah.
Yes, uh, my question is if those type of initiatives, global initiatives such as the bond challenge and the consortium you've described today, also have considered where are they going to plant those seeds because it's indeed a challenge to produce those seeds, but an equal challenge or I don't know if even more complicated, it's uh, where to sow these seeds in the field because uh, it sounds terrific of uh, Mexico having committed to restore eight, eight million hectares yeah. or so. But my question is where, where and uh, in what scheme? Because in most of those lands, there are people and uh, it's not necessarily productive for them I, to restore natural systems. Yeah. So I, my question is if, if there's also an initiative uh, coupled with these uh, based on seeds, also based on, on the way uh, to find where to plant those seeds. Well, you, you, there's a number of things in there again. Um, the HE targets, which talk about restoring 15% of degraded land, um, in the 20 targets, the ones towards the, the under, under uh, strategic goals E um, are to do with participatory approaches. So they're very much meant to be um, the targets delivered through uh, engagement with communities. So to a, to a certain extent that is covered. How, it, how effective that is, how it, efficiently it works <clears throat> is a different matter. I'm sure that varies from country to country and from region to region. In terms of where, exactly where, uh, I mean I don't know. Uh, and again, it will vary between countries. But one thing that I was told, uh, and I've sourced the paper since, is by um, the new uh, Assistant Director General at, uh, for, for Climate Change at FAO, uh, René Castro, Ooh. that in fact, although the 350 million hectares is the target, there was a publication in Science about a month ago that suggested the total land available for replanting is, is not 0.35 mi uh, billion hectares, but 0.9 billion hectares based on their spatial analysis and taking into account no um, impact on existing agricultural land. So those guys are saying it can be done based on what's available without taking out of play existing agricultural land. So obviously there are, there, there, there's a lot of thinking about how to deliver what you want, which is putting the, the material in the right place. Yeah. Favor, Jesus. Gracias. In relation with the landscape sustainability, uh, what do you think about the uh, agricultural frontier expense in the world, like in, the, in Brazil, for the soybean production. Yeah. Expansion? Yeah. The expansion of the agricultural frontier, like in Brazil. And, and that clearly is an issue, because there's supposedly been an acceleration of forest deforestation in the last year. Um, well, you know, the resolution of this really sits with national governments. Um, and. That's why I said before, you know, in some ways, if we can try to hold them account, which is to ask questions, um, because they are both allowing uh, concessions for, for removal of commercial timbers and saying that they are reforesting. You know, so they, governments are, are the ones who are doing both at the same time. So all, all we can do is sort of uh, query and, and encourage and, and, and lobby. Um, but... Uh, it's obviously this issue around commercial importance, and, and which is usually a short-term resolution, as opposed to the long-term benefits of creating a, a, a landscape which is sustainable. So that they're on two different timescales, I think, is the problem. Two, two at the back? Yeah. Uh, I, w I would like um, to hear a little bit more about um, the, the legal status of the seeds. Uh, you mentioned that uh, yeah. all you have has a non-commercial clause about them. And in terms maybe uh, also related to the question about uh, where to plant those seeds, 
uh, and who will plant them? So, so the question is the legal status of the seeds on, in those banks uh, in terms also of accessibility. Who, who can access to those seeds? And because the people who will access those seeds, I suppose, is the people who will decide where to plant them. Yeah, it's, it's going to depend a lot on, on um, the situation. So I guess you need a sort of situation analysis. Um, I was talking about um, the conservation collections in the Millennium Seed Bank. They um, are stored under um, the CBD compliance agreements. There are strict controls. So those seeds are not being given away to someone else. That's a slightly different situation to um, the material which um, we're thinking about here in terms of being available in the native seed trade or the commercial seed trade, uh, which clearly is a sort of financial transaction. Somebody's buying the seeds, uh, whatever the source. Um, the implementation on the ground, there's no doubt that the, the best implementers will be local communities because they will be responsible, more, feel more responsible for maintaining um, the environment. I didn't mention it here, but the Great Green Wall uh, project that Q was part of until last year, so for five or so years, which is an FAO initiative to plant um, through the Sahel, sub-Saharan Africa, um, from west to east. So I think it's a 6,000 kilometer line, or basically of trees, that they are choosing native species and they are working with, I remember one paper in 2016 that talked of 93 communities. Um, they're working communities to, uh, to select the right species, that's one thing, but also develop nursery practice, which allows them to um, intercrop. So they don't mind, the communities don't mind growing uh, seedlings of trees for planting, uh, and indeed planting the trees, and maintaining them as they grow, uh, but they need a short-term cash return. And so uh, local... Uh, let's say, uh, underutilized species, leafy vegetables of value locally. Um, they're helping them establish nurseries and um, so the sort of intercropping approach. So depending on the country, depending on the project, depending on the location and so on, all of these components clearly can come together. How well they come together, I'm sure, will vary a lot. Um, but I think there are some good examples out there of, of clearly some progress being made. And Great Green Wall is, uh, through FAO, is one of them, actually. Hi. Um, congrats for your, your talk. I found it very, <clears throat> very interesting. And my question is... Um, I have been hearing about the conservation seed banks, but the next step would be where to grow those plants and uh, where to produce them, because, well, a lot of seeds, you can just throw them and they will grow, but most of them, and mostly uh, endangered species, you have to grow them for years before you replant it or yeah. take them back to whatever ecosystem you will want to. So my question is, is there a strategy to grow those plants or to cultivate them or propagate them in, in some places? Or where, where, should you, where would you get those plants before their reforestation? Well, well, growing them and getting them are two different things. Uh, the growing, oh, yeah. um, under the CBD, which was established in 1992, I think all the countries that signed up were committed to developing biodiversity action plans. And within each national biodiversity action plan, the focus will have been on the most threatened species. In the UK, they're called Schedule 8. Um, and that includes propagation protocols and so on, and indeed um, restoring them, reintroducing them to the natural environment. So I, I, I guess that is ongoing. And that's, but that's within the sort of national sector, if you might imagine, the government sector. So availability... I think it's within formal programs. So you, if you were interested, you'd need to join a formal program, I guess. Um, that's I my understanding. Please. Can I tell you something about Mexico? I mean, this is a, a pilot project that we have at uh, Iztacala, where we have a, on the umbrella of the Newton Fund uh, program, and we got some grants, uh, we have CONAFOR, PRONATURA, and uh, UNAM working together. So we are characterizing the seeds, especially this thing of uh, when it starts and ends, the physiological thing, 
and, uh, and all, the, all the behavior of the seeds, the basic physiological behavior of the seeds. And then Pronatura uses this, this information and is producing the seeds. And then with Conafort, and, the, and, and Conafort is funding for um, reintroducing these things, these seeds in uh, s small parts in <coughs> Veracruz. That's what we are doing. So it is just a pilot project. For, this is exactly what we have to end up doing, just putting together people of different institutions working on different things and trying to to help to, to get into the res restoration. Because the problem is that when you are talking about restoration, what you need are seeds. Lots of seeds, but not any seed, but a special seed with a special traits. And so that's what we are doing. But this is just a pilot project. And uh, Pranatura, for example, is, is, is in charge of producing seeds. But one of the problems that Pranatura had is that they were producing seeds for <coughs> seeds. And now what we are trying is to help them, to lead them to, to produce the seeds that we think are the best things to be used, to be to restored. And on the other hand, seeds that are collected by us and Pranatura are put into the bank, into the seed bank. Also. So it's like a good cycle that we are starting to do since uh, six months, one year ago. Ajari. Gracias. Thank you very much for your talk. I was just wondering if you could tell us um, which kind of laws would help to um, protect seeds and conserve them and um, translating these kind of strategies in really conservation strategies. Because in the sustainability coordination in the university, we are trying to put together different actors, different languages, if you can say it like that. And it's not always easy to to translate the scientific language in laws. So just wanted to know how, if you have, if, if you could share with us some ideas um, about that. You, in your uh, talk, you were talking about, about the importance of government <coughs> in conservation and the opposite. So that's why. Yeah. Um, well, that's, that's a multifaceted <coughs> question. Um, the, the laws are f not around the seeds, but for protection of species. And so there are, you know, CBD, um, and there are strategies supporting, like the Global Strategy for Plant Conservation, which will be renewed uh, next year, coming to the end of a 10-year period. The HE biodiversity targets. Um, whereas on the seed side, the laws are to do with the commercial um, exchange of, of material. In other words, it's a contract, you're buying seeds. And those laws uh, relate really to agricultural species, not to native species. And they are enshrined um, and underpin um, the, I mean, in terms of quality assurance, the availability of that seed. So the International Seed Testing Association, which was established in the 1920s, have established laboratories, um, accredited laboratories, that are able to carry out a precise germination test under prescribed conditions, so sort of a law, um, and then you, you have um, X percent germination, that goes on the certificate, and that certificate uh, um, supports the sale of those seeds in commerce. So that th those laws are absolutely precise and clear. And the point I made about Europe is that uh, availability of fodder species, it, um, as opposed to in indicator species or protected species, um, is covered by the, those EU laws. And that's why those seeds are so available. Whereas there are no laws, there's a negative law, you're not allowed to have uh, in a fodder uh, seed lot um, contamination from other species. So there's a negative approach. But in terms of a positive intervention for regulations around seed quality for native species, I don't think they're really there. Um, so it's something that you have to um, try and establish first. If we think about ISTA, so they've been running since 1920, so we're 100 years in. 
So it could take a while. You know, first you have to start, have to establish guidelines. Uh, then you have to write out the prescription. You will germinate it like this. Then you need a blind test. So it's a, a, a wild species and you're going to sow it under these conditions and you're going to send the seed to four laboratories and they all have the same incubator and it's all set to the same temperature. And then uh, the st statistical analysis follows. And if they comply, then that could turn into a rule, which is pretty close to being a sort of law. But we are way, way from that with native species. So I think we're going to be left with guidelines for a long, long time on quality assurance for native species seed. The, the protection of species, stacks of laws, um, national and international. Si no la hay, pues no nos queda más que agradecer al doctor Hugh Pritchard su presentación y muchas gracias a todos ustedes por estar aquí. Se los agradezco. Thank you, Hugh. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Oh, yeah. Thank you.